focus on our critical suppliers uh, will guide many of the decisions that we have made. Now let me turn to the quality of our all volunteer force. The most fundamental element in our strategy and in our decision making process is our people. This budget recognizes that they, far more than any weapon system, far more than any technology, are the great strength of the United States military. For that reason, we focus first on every other area of the defense enterprise for savings in order to minimize any impact on the quality of the troops and their families. As a result, we were able to sustain or enhance critical support programs while reforming and reorganizing others to be more <laughs> effective and responsive to the needs of their troops and, and their families. Yet in order to build the force needed to defend the country under existing budget constraints, the escalating growth in personnel costs must be confronted. This is an area of the budget that has grown by nearly 90 percent since 2001. The budget will contain a roadmap to try to address the costs of military pay, health care, and retirement in ways that we believe are fair, transparent, and consistent with our fundamental commitments to our people. We recognize through this process that we can never repay our service members or their families for all of their sacrifices. On compensation for service members, we've created sufficient room in the budget to allow for full pay raises in 2013 and 2014 that keep pace with increases in private sector pay. In addition, let me make clear, nobody's pay will be cut. Nobody's pay will be cut. With regards to pay raises, however, in order to achieve cost savings, we will provide more limited pay raises beginning in 2015. That will give troops and their families fair notice and lead time before these proposed changes go into effect. On health care, another area of tremendous cost growth in the department. We've avoided changes that negatively impact active duty troops or their families. We've protected health care services for, for these troops, for our wounded warriors. But we decided that to help control the growth of health care costs, which is now almost $50 billion in this department, we are recommending increases in health care fees, co-pays, and deductibles for retirees. They'll be phased in over five years. But let me be clear that even after these increases, the cost borne by military retirees will remain below levels in most comparable private sector plans, as they should be. We also feel that the fair way to address military retirement costs is to ask Congress to establish a commission with authority to conduct a comprehensive review of military retirement. But the President and the Department have made clear that the retirement benefits of those who currently serve will be protected by grandfathering their benefits. There will be, for those who serve today, no changes in retirement benefits. Finally, let me just conclude. Uh, putting together this kind of budget that maintains the quality of an all-volunteer force and implements significant mandated savings has been a difficult undertaking. This has been tough work. And at the same time, we have viewed it as an important opportunity to try to shape the force we need for the future. I believe we developed a, a very complete package aligned to achieve our strategic <clears throat> aims. The bottom line is that there is little room here uh, for significant modification if we want to preserve the force and the capabilities that we believe we need in order to protect the country and the fully assigned missions that we have to deal with. Ultimately, we will need the support and the partnership 
of Congress to implement the vision that we have for a future military. And we look forward to working with the Congress in this effort. After all, it was a bipartisan Congress that mandated that we reduce the defense budget by $487 billion over 10 years. So we look forward to their partnership in this effort. Make no mistake, the savings that we are proposing will impact on all 50 states and many districts, congressional districts across America. This will be a test, a test of whether reducing the deficit is about talk or about action. I understand how tough these kinds of issues can be. And I understand also that this is the beginning and not the end of this process. But my hope is that when members understand the sacrifice involved in reducing the defense budget by almost a half a trillion dollars, that it will convince Congress of the important responsibility they have to make sure that we avoid sequestration. That would be a doubling of the cuts, another $500 billion in additional cuts that would be required to take place through a meat axe approach and that we are convinced would hollow out the force and would inflict severe damage to our national defense for generations. So the leadership of this department, both military and civilian, we are united behind the strategy that we have presented. And we look forward to working closely with the leaders of the Hill to do what the American people expect of all of their leaders, to be fiscally responsible at a time of record deficits and a record national debt to use this opportunity to develop the force we need for the future, a force that can effectively defend this country, a force that can support our men and women in uniform and their families, and a force that is and always will be the strongest military power in the world. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Just a few weeks ago, we released the new defense strategy. It's a strategy that keeps America safe. It represents clear strategic choices in the context of a persistently dangerous and increasingly competitive security environment. These choices are reflected in the president's proposed defense budget for the next fiscal year. As with the strategy, the Joint Chiefs and I work closely with the president, with Secretary Panetta, the service secretaries, and importantly, our senior enlisted advisors. And throughout, we made sure that the unique strengths of each service were recognized. At the same time, we put national security above parochial interests, exactly what the American people should expect from us. In the end, we prepared a budget that strikes an appropriate and necessary balance between succeeding in today's conflicts and preparing for tomorrow's. This balance accounts for real risks and real fiscal constraints. It represents responsible investment in our national security. But make no mistake, the trade-offs were tough. The choices were complex. The difficult decisions represented here produced $259 billion in savings over the next five years. And this is just the first installment on our way to half a trillion dollars in defense savings. Even with these reductions, the budget still makes a $614 billion investment in our nation's security. It maintains our military's decisive edge and helps sustain America's global leadership. And it keeps faith with the true source of our military strength, and that, of course, is our people. Much will be said and written about the individual decisions underlying this budget. Some may be tempted to view them through the prism of a zero-sum game, parsing through each cut each change to look for a winner and a loser. That's actually the least productive way to assess this budget. Instead, the merits of our choices should be viewed in the context of an evolving security environment 
and a longer term plan for the joint force. This budget is the first step. It's a down payment as we transition from an emphasis on today's wars to preparing for tomorrow's. Allow me to make just a few additional and brief points about what this budget means for the joint force, force of 2020. First, capability is more important than size. Yes, the strategy and budget reduce force size, we get leaner, but this budget does not lead to a military in decline. Rather, it builds a force that matches capabilities to needs. It leads to a joint force that is global and networked, that is versatile and innovative, that is ably led, and that is always ready. It's a force that's prepared to secure global access and respond to global contingencies. It's a military that can win any conflict anywhere. Second is the issue of compensation reform. I want to make clear that cuts in spending will not fall on the shoulders of our troops. There are no proposed freezes or reductions in pay. There is no change to the high quality of health care our active duty members and medically retired and wounded warriors receive. But we cannot, we cannot ignore some hard realities. Pay and benefits are now roughly one-third of the defense spending. So pay will need to grow more slowly in the future. And as the Secretary mentioned, the budget proposes modest increases in health care fees, co-pays, and deductibles for retirees. And we also need to look at retirement, but we'll take, that, we'll take the time to determine how to enact any retirement reforms over the next year. Last is risk. The primary risk lie not in what we can do, but in how much we can do and how fast we can do it. The risks, therefore, are in, time, in terms of time and capacity. And we fully considered these risks. I'm convinced we can properly manage them by ensuring we keep the force in balance, investing in new capabilities and preserving a strong reserve component. And as I've said before, we will face greater risks if we don't change the way we've been doing things. Three weeks ago, I noted that we have a real strategy that reflects real choices. The President's forthcoming budget proposal embodies these realities. I'm confident it meets our nation's needs in our current fights and for our future. Thank you. We'll have time for a few questions. And I'll <laughs> Um, Mr. Secretary, you touched a little bit on this, but over the next 10 years, do you see any other year than this year where the actual spending will go down um, from year to year? And just to the American public more broadly, how do you, do you sort of explain what appears to be contradictory as you talk about repeatedly this $500 billion in cuts in a Defense Department budget that is actually going to be increasing over time. And then just quickly for uh, Mr. Chairman, can you address specifically the 490,000 as far as the size of the Army? Is it the right number and what are the ri actual risks in that? Yeah, I think uh, the simplest way to say this is that uh, under the, uh, the budget that was uh, submitted in the past, we had a projected growth level for the defense budget. And that growth would have uh, provided for uh, almost $500 billion. Uh, in growth, uh, and we had uh, obviously dedicated that to uh, a number of uh, plans and projects that we would have. Uh, that's got to be cut, and that's a real cut in terms of what, what our projected growth would be. Uh, so uh, the, the reason you're seeing the tough decisions that are being presented to you uh, in the implementation of this strategy is because we had to achieve savings that would meet the requirement that Congress gave us. Uh, and that is tough, it's real, and it's something that uh, obviously will cause some pain, but at the same time, uh, we recognize that defense has to play a role in dealing with a national deficit. In terms of the size of the Army, briefly, it's, I, I'm confident that 490 active, by the way, uh, is, the, is the right number for 2017 may not be the right number for 2020. I've always said that the, the, uh, the Army, uh, when I was the Army Chief, that the Army needs to be adaptable enough to provide the greatest number of options given the, the security environment we face. So we, we grew the Army to confront a particular kind of conflict to conduct the, the stability operations counterinsurgency uh, strategies that we were asked to execute, those demands are going down. I think it's perfectly reasonable that the force structure of the active army would go down. Brian? Mr. Secretary, you talked about the additional request for war spending. 
I think right. you said 88.4 billion right. versus 